Spotlight, lectures and performances on and around Albany State University. On behalf of our President Dr. Freeman and our Albany State University family, I would like to welcome you to today's lecture series presented by Mr. W. David Tarver. My name is Brandy Thompson, a freshman here at Albany State University, a dual major in forensics and mathematics, and a member of the Velma Fudge Grant Honors Program, and I have the honor of being your presider for today's events. So without further ado, I would like to ask Ms. Chelsea Basley to come up and give our introduction of the speaker, and following her, we will have Mr. W. David Tarver give his presentation. Please come in that order. My name is Chelsea Elise Vasley, and I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker for today, Mr. W. David Tarver. Mr. David Tarver has acquired many vital roles in society as an African American, entrepreneur, engineer, corporate executive, and community leader. He is the author of a new book that traces his successful high technology business from youthful dream to adult reality. The book is titled, Proving Ground, A Memoir. Mr. David Tarver was born and raised in Flint, Michigan. He graduated from Flint Central High School in 1971, and then he enrolled in General Motors Institute to study engineering. After two years at General Motors Institute, he transferred to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He received bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan and then went to work for AT&T Bell Laboratories in Homedale, New Jersey. Mr. Tarver left Bell Labs in 1983 to start Telecom Analysis Systems, a manufacturer of advanced telecommunications test instruments. He started the company in his basement with Bell Labs colleagues, Mr. Steve Moore and Mr. Charles Simmons. Mr. Tarver built telecom analysis systems from a tiny startup to a multi-million dollar company with customers in more than 25 countries. In 1995, he engineered the sale of the company to Bortho, which is now Spirant, for $30 million. From 1996 to 1999, Mr. Tarver spearheaded development of Spearrent telecommunications test equipment business that achieved sales of over $250 million and a market value in excess of $2 billion. He left Spearrent as president of the telecom equipment business unit at the end of 1999. In 2001, Mr. Tarver founded the Red Bank Education and Development Initiative in Red Bank, New Jersey. The community-based nonprofit organization catalyzed dramatic improvements in academic performance and opportunities for Red Bank children. In 2007, he returned to Michigan, where he resides with his lovely wife, Ms. Kishna Tarver, and beautiful daughter, Nadia Louise. Since returning to Michigan, Mr. Tarver completed and published Proving Ground, a memoir, and is now lecturing on entrepreneurship at his very own alma mater, the University of Michigan. Please join me in giving a warm round welcome to Mr. W. David Tarver. Thank you, Chelsea and Brandy. And, uh, really great to be here in Albany this morning. I've spent uh, a lot of hot summers in Albany when I was growing up because uh, I have people here, some of whom are coming in right now. Let me get this off of here. So uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, this morning about uh, my own journey through technology and race and business. Okay, so uh, I'm going to allow uh, some time for questions later, so I'm not going to uh, take a lot of time with uh, talking, uh, more than usual, but uh, I also want to let you know uh, that we can stay in touch after the presentation today. Uh, you can reach me through any of these mechanisms. Uh, the pro the uh, uh, website for the book is provinggroundbook.com 
And my own website is davidtarver.com. And you can reach me by email at davidtarver at davidtarver.com. So let's stay in touch. First thing I want to say is that uh, uh, this is home for me. And I don't mean it's home right now. It's not where I live right now. But this is where my family is from. Uh, this is a picture of my great, great, great grandmother, Cassie Alexander. And Cassie Alexander was a slave here in Georgia. And uh, she is the progenitor of uh, my mother's side of the family. And uh, my great-grandfather had a farm over in Camilla. And so a big branch of our family is based over in Camilla and Thomasville. And my father's side of the family is from the Albany area. So we have my father's people around here and up in uh, Atlanta. And I understand that there's a Tarverville, Georgia, somewhere around here. I guess that's where the plantation was. Uh, so again, I have deep roots here in Georgia. And um, I was uh, born in 1953 up in Flint, Michigan. And uh, I, I want to show you a couple of pictures that illustrate that it was a different time in 1953 than it is now. So that's me as a little kid. This is a picture of the Detroit Tigers baseball team in 1953. What do you notice about this picture that's maybe different from today? Right. We were living in a totally segregated society, north and south, in the 50s. And this is the society that I was born into. And it wasn't only segregated in the sports world, of course, it was segregated in the corporate world as well. Well, my father, uh, this is a picture of my father uh, when he left the Army, when he was in the Army in uh, the 40s. He served in World War II in the Signal Corps in the Aleutian Islands. And I don't know if it was because of that, but my father had a deep interest in uh, electronics and radio and eventually television. And because he had that interest in television that, and radio and electronics, that rubbed off on me. Well, because of the time, uh, I suppose, my father never worked in electronics. Uh, because as I say, we were living in a very much a segregated society. Now, I'm kind of ashamed of the fact that I don't have a picture of my mother from those days. But uh, fortunately, my mother is right here. She came down here with me today. My mother, uh, Claudia Louise Tarver, uh, I talk about uh, all of my family in, in the first chapter of the book. And my mother uh, was working here one night at uh, Phoebe Hospital. And, you know, something happened that night that was the cause of us being in Michigan, the cause of me growing up in Michigan rather than growing up in Georgia. And what happened was, uh, in those days, again, Phoebe had a white side and a black side. And my mother, who had graduated from the Grady School of Nursing, in those days it was called the Grady Colored School of Nursing, uh, she was working as a registered nurse at Phoebe Hospital. And she had to go to the bathroom, bad. And so she figured she would just duck into a white bathroom that was nearby. And someone saw her coming out of that white bathroom, and she was severely reprimanded for that. And that's when she and my father decided to leave Albany and move up north. And uh, they went to Flint, Michigan, and that's why I ended up growing up in Flint. So as a kid in Flint, uh, again, because my father was so interested in electronics and had all kinds of gadgets and uh, electronic components and books around the house, I became interested in electronics at home and started working on it. And uh, I got involved in uh, the local science fair in Flint. Uh, it's something that all the kids were encouraged to do in those days, but I thought that I had a project that was going to beat every other kid because, again, I was into electronics. And so I had a robot that I built in 1963 that had a photocell on it. A photocell was a brand new thing in those days. And if you would shine a light on the back of this robot, it would move. 
And so I convinced all of my friends that I was going to win first place in the Flint Area Science Fair in 1963. Well, as it turned out, I didn't win. I didn't place. I didn't come in the top 50. And uh, needless to say, I was uh, kind of upset. And I wondered why this was. Well, I was too young to worry about race being a cause of anything. I didn't really understand what was going on. But as it turned out, I learned a, a really hard lesson. And that lesson was about the scientific method. Who here knows about the scientific method or has heard about the scientific method? Okay. Well, the whole idea of the science fair was to teach us the scientific method. And I didn't use it. All I did was build a robot. Okay. And so uh, scientific method says ask a question, form a hypothesis, design an experiment, record your results based on that, you know, draw some conclusion. I didn't do that. I just said, see my cool robot. And so that taught me a, a very important lesson uh, very early. So by the time I got to high school, I decided to try this science fair thing again. And I decided to go ahead and use uh, the scientific method. And so in, in my senior year in high school, I actually was a finalist in the science fair. I was actually a finalist in the Flint Area Science Fair each of the four years of high school. But in senior year, my project dealt with the effects of gamma radiation on the characteristic curves of transistors. And uh, as I say, I was a finalist. I ended up winning second place. Well, I took the picture from the front page of the Flint Journal. In those days, if you were a finalist in the science fair, they would print your picture on the front page of the paper. And this is the picture from uh, from that science fair, uh, except that I colorized myself for emphasis. <laughs> uh, but if you notice, I didn't look pleased uh, in that picture. And the fact of the matter is, I was quite upset because I thought I should have won first place and I got second place. Uh, so at the same time, this was high school. And this was the 60s, the late 60s, early 70s. And I had resolved at that time that I wanted my career to be in electronics and that I wanted to start a company uh, in the electronics field. And there were two things that were pushing me on and were giving me belief that I could do this. You saw the picture earlier of the Detroit Tigers, right? Well, this is the picture that was fused in my mind during the 60s, you know, the civil rights movement. And my friends and I, saw this and in a lot of cases we participated in what was happening in the civil rights movement in our town and we just felt like things were changing and I was convinced that this was a trend this was a huge wave in society that was going to make things different for me than they had been for my father so I was convinced that if I wanted to start an electronics business or work in the field of electronics I could do it things were different now another thing that had happened that was uh, a huge trend in society was a technological thing. Uh, does anybody know what this picture depicts? I was in New Jersey at uh, Middlesex County College and none of the college students there knew what it was either. Because, you know, I think if you're a certain age, if you're below a certain age, you don't know about this picture. If you're above a certain age, it's like iconic. These are the three guys who invented the transistor in 1947 at a place called Bell Laboratories. And uh, the transistor gave rise to something called the integrated circuit. Integrated circuit gave rise to the microcomputer. And the microcomputer gave rise to, lo and behold, all these devices that we use every day, right? These things are full of computer technology. But it all started with these three guys at Bell Labs because if there had been no transistor, there would be no cell phone. There would be no computers as we know them today. So that was an important movement. And my father, again, was very much into transistors. He had books on transistors and not only that, but lasers and all kinds of things at home. And so I grew up around this technology. And I could see, again, that there was an opportunity there for me. 
So, following on my science fair mentality, I figured that my ultimate experiment was going to be to start a business, start my own electronics manufacturing company from scratch. That's what my experiment in life was going to be. And in some ways, uh, I didn't care one way or the other whether I succeeded. Of course I wanted to succeed, but I wanted to find out if it was possible to do this given the changes that had occurred in society. So I started out college at a place called General Motors Institute. Uh, and the main reason I went to General Motors Institute was that uh, uh, it was a place where you earned money working co-op assignments and the money you made working co-op more than paid for your tuition and room and board. So in effect it was free. And so when my father heard about this opportunity, even though I had applied to other places like University of Michigan and Harvard and whatnot, uh, my father said one simple thing. He said, GMI is free, boy. <laughs> and so, of course, I went to GMI. Uh, while I was there, something important happened. Can you hear that? I was, at, um, I was in the gymnasium at General Motors Institute one night. I just stumbled in there. I wasn't intending to go. And I heard this. This was a, uh, an electronic music concert that was performed on something called a Moog electronic music synthesizer. That's what you see in the background there, a big black cabinet with the knobs on it and whatnot. And uh, I walked into this gymnasium and there was a, a group of uh, folks there playing this music on these synthesizers. And I was absolutely amazed and I said, this is what I have to do. This is gonna be my career. I'm gonna design and build electronic music synthesizers. I'll let that play out. <laughs> Around the same time, my uh, musical hero, who happened to be pretty much everybody's musical hero, Stevie Wonder, came out with this album called Talking Book. And on this album, he made extensive use of electronic music synthesizers. Before I had been at that concert in the gym, I didn't know what it was, but when I heard Stevie do it, I said, oh man. This, and so that only solidified my idea about making my own music synthesizer. So uh, after two years at General Motors Institute, I figured that General Motors probably wasn't a good place for a guy who wanted to design music synthesizers. So I transferred from General Motors to University of Michigan as a junior. And this is a picture of me and I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of light up here. 1974, uh, everybody looked like that. It was flower power, big hair, all that kind of thing. I would do it today, but it's going out of fashion. Uh, so at any rate, uh, my master's thesis at University of Michigan was the design and construction of a digital electronic uh, music synthesizer. And I finished that thesis. Uh, I was working on it the whole time I was a student at University of Michigan. I'd go to class during the day, go home at night, work on my synthesizer. And uh, that's what I did. So when I graduated from University of Michigan, uh, I got a job at the one place, the best place that you could go to work as an electrical engineer in those days, Bell Laboratories the place where a transistor was invented. I had heard about this place all my life. It was like a magical place. Not only was a transistor invented there, the communication satellite, the data modem, uh, practically everything that we know and use. If some of you are in programming and you program in the C language, a C++, this kind of thing, that all came out of Bell Labs. And so naturally, as an electrical engineer in those days, that's where you wanted to work. Well, I figured I would stay there for a couple years get enough experience to start my business and go start my business. Uh, and so I continued to work on this music synthesizer in the basement uh, while I worked at Bell Lab during the day. Well, uh, there was one point during that time when this dream of building my own music synthesizers came to a halt. It just died. Uh, and the reason that that happened was that uh, I had spent six years 
developing this music synthesizer and I had never talked to anybody about developing a music synthesizer. I never talked to any uh, musicians. I never talked to anybody in the industry. I just did this all by myself. So it was more of a dream uh, or something that I was piddling around with than something that had the potential to be a business. So when I finally did take it to some musicians at a local music store, uh, they told me all the things that were wrong with it and all the reasons why they couldn't use it and why nobody would pay the money I wanted them to pay for this thing. And so I was extremely disappointed. I was crushed. And that dream just died. Well, I had another opportunity uh, that was a result of my work on that music synthesizer. Something I didn't expect happened. Uh, I was working in the lab at uh, Bell Laboratories, working on my uh, project there, which involved measuring the characteristics of data communications lines. And in the course of that work, I had to use a box that looked like this. And again, it's a bad picture, but it looked like a lunch pail with knobs on it. Uh, this was a device that generated different kinds of interference. And I would generate interference with this box, and I would measure it with my instruments, and uh, that's how I went. Well, this thing cost $6,000, and it was basically a, you know, a piece of old technology, let's say. <laughs> And uh, I figured that I could do a better job with this with digital technology. So, and, and this was almost like a music synthesizer. It just was used for a different purpose. So I could sell this thing for much more money, sell it to engineers. I knew how it was used because I was using it. So I figured, Psh, there's my project, there's my product. But I decided that I was going to be serious this time. I wasn't going to do it alone. Uh, so I recruited a couple of fellows from the job to work with me. Now mind you, uh, you might get the idea, looking at this picture, that there were lots and lots of black people working at Bell Labs. Uh, but there were not. There were 5,000 people in the building that we were working in, and maybe 50 of the engineers in that building were black. But five of them happened to be in my group. And uh, so I recruited these guys to work with me uh, on this project. And uh, I didn't ask them to leave their jobs. They worked on this project at night. We spent uh, from about 7 p.m. to about 2 in the morning every night working on developing this product. We'd get up in the morning, go to work at 8.30, stay there till 6, 7 o'clock at night. So we did this for some period of time and I have evidence because uh, and let me back up for a second. I want to let you know who these guys are. The guy on the left is uh, Steve Moore. He graduated from University of South Carolina uh, in electrical engineering with a 3.9 something GPA in the 70s. University of South Carolina. That tells you something about this brother. As soon as I met him, I said, I have to, I'll, if I start a business someday, he's going to be one of the first people I hire. Uh, Steve likes to tell the story that uh, if he hadn't gone to engineering school, he would be dead or in jail because a lot of his peers from the town he was from, a little town called York, South Carolina, that was their fate. He went to engineering school and ended up at Bell Labs. Charles Simmons, you see him with his Atlanta shirt on, he went to Morehouse in the dual degree program, got a degree in physics and uh, Math, physics and uh, engineering from Georgia Tech and uh, Morehouse, and then he went to Stanford to graduate school. Um, so I recruited those guys. We went to work in the basement. There's Steve working in the basement, building the prototype. There's me sitting in one of my bedrooms writing software. And after two years in the basement, we come out with this ugly looking box as our prototype of our product. Well, it was an ugly looking box, but it had nine microcomputers inside. It had all kinds of special purpose digital signal processing hardware. And it did what that ugly lunch pail box did, but it did it automatically and under digital control. And uh, I'll skip through that, but after uh, some more work, this is what it looked like. We had some industrial design done on the product. You have to pretty it up. We couldn't sell something that looked like that prototype. This is what the final product looked like. 
and we shipped our first product in 1984 from the basement. Well, that year of 1984 was an ugly year, that first year in business. Uh, I left Bell Labs in October of 1983. Uh, to finish the business plan, to get the financing lined up, to start working on a prototype. Uh, we formed a corporation in Fe February of 1984, and at that point, Steve left Bell Labs. Now, Steve had just gotten married the previous summer, uh, and his wife didn't marry him with the understanding that he was going to leave Bell Labs and come work in my basement. So, there was some consternation there in the family, but his wife believed in him, and she allowed him <laughs> to uh, continue to be crazy with me. Uh, and then we shipped our first product in May of 1984. And in June, we moved to our first commercial location. This was in a place called the Red Bank Mini Mall in Red Bank, New Jersey. We had a little 800 square foot place. On one side of us was a tanning salon, and on the other side was a travel agency. And here's a world headquarters of our electronics manufacturing business. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, in July, the other guy, Charles, got married and he got promoted at Bell Labs. Well, in August, he leaves Bell Labs <laughs> and comes to work in my basement. So uh, I think the folks at Bell Labs thought that we were either crazy or something. Uh, but at any rate, we managed to uh, get things going. We hired a few people, moved to yet another building. A couple years later, we moved to a big industrial park building. We developed more products uh, through the uh, 80s. Uh, we uh, established international sales. This is a picture from my first trip to Japan in 1987. And uh, we ended up selling more product in Japan some months than we did in the US. And we found you know, great reception there even though I was initially concerned about, you know, how are these Japanese engineers going to respond to a young black engineer from a tiny company in America, we found that they were very receptive because the one thing that they cared about more than anything else was that we had worked at Bell Labs. And to them, Bell Labs was like a, the golden key. So, uh, this kind of shows what our sales did. Uh, we ramped up, those are the blue lines, they were the actual sales, uh, the gold lines were what we projected. Uh, we ramped up pretty steadily uh, through the 80s. Uh, we had a dip in 1992, which was a cause for a lot of concern. Then we uh, developed a new product line in the area of testing wireless devices. Our previous products were involved in testing modems. Uh, and with that, the sales took off once again. I say it like this was all easy, but of course, <laughs> uh, there was a lot of crying and a lot of grief and a lot of uh, losing hair involved in all of these things. Uh, so uh, in 1995, we sold the company to a British outfit called Bothorp PLC for $30 million. And it was a couple days before Thanksgiving, and I tell you, it felt like a combination of uh, Independence Day and Thanksgiving, you know, rolled into one because we knew at that, that point that we could do what we wanted with the rest of our lives. And uh, it was a tremendous uh, feeling. So what does this mean uh, for you in particular? Uh, you know, again, as I said at the beginning, I started this as an experiment to see what was possible. And I think that we saw the results of the experiment in terms of uh, what we did with this business. Well, what I think it means is that things have changed a lot in this country. There are some things that have changed. There are some things that haven't changed. But if you have something that you're passionate about, you can do it. And the things that it requires, in addition to that passion, is a deep expertise in some area. If you're going to start a business in some area, you need to know that uh, as well as anyone else, better than most people. Okay, and that's what you're here for. That's why you go to class every day. That's why you do the homework sets. You know, that's why you get co-op assignments, to get that deep expertise. Malcolm Gladwell says, he's a guy who wrote a book called The Outliers, uh, to be an expert in something takes 10,000 hours of work. And so if you just tally up how much time have you spent, what do you spend your time doing? 
You know, if you spend your time getting expertise in some field that you're interested in that is saleable, then you're going to succeed. Uh, and if you spend your time on a variety of things or things that are not particularly productive, uh, then you're going to reap the, re the results of that. Uh, so it takes passion, it takes deep experience, it takes deep expertise rather, it takes determination because people at every turn are going to resist you. It's not easy to go out and have a successful company. It's not easy to be successful in a corporate setting. You always get resistance. And so you have to realize that you're going to get that resistance and you just have to plow through it. Okay, but you can't be deterred by the fact that you got resistance. It takes teamwork. I got nowhere trying to develop that music synthesizer by myself. But when I teamed up with Steve and Charles, we were able to make this thing happen. And it takes belief. You have to believe that you can do it. Uh, when it comes down to, you know, late at night, you're in the middle of some difficult situation, you don't know whether you're going to make it or not. If you don't believe you're going to make it, chances are you may not. So that's what I drew from that 12-year experience of uh, building this company. The other thing I would say to people who think about starting a business is get started on some level. It's easier today than ever to do the research. You know, you have Google, you have all kinds of tools that uh, you can use to uh, get expertise. You have all kinds of online resources for getting information. So I say get started. And lastly, I'll say that in, in doing that, in getting started, I had a tremendous role model because that's exactly what my father did. Even though he was denied a lot of the opportunity that he wanted or that other people had, he didn't let that stop him from pursuing his passion. And although my father never worked in the electronics field, never started a business, the fact that he did what he did is what enabled me to do what I did. So I always tell people, get started. You, you don't know where it's going to end up. It may not end up helping you. It may help somebody else. But the key is to get started and to be persistent in pursuing your goal. So thank you very much for coming today. I appreciate it.